Hey folks, uh, before I get started with the slides, I just wanted to thank everybody personally for coming out here. There's a lot of great speakers, a lot of good stuff going on, so I really appreciate that you find this topic interesting enough to come listen to me speak about it. Um, the talk is migrating to IDM in a large Linux environment, and we're going to start by basically going over what the environment currently looks like. Um, and just in case there's somebody in the crowd that doesn't know what IDM is, it's basically a uh, tightly coupled product that Red Hat is offering that combines Kerberos and some DNS and um, PKI and also, um, I feel like I'm missing some, uh, lots of other things as well. But people like to kind of lovingly refer to it as AD for Linux. So Red Hat as a whole has different pillars inside uh, that do different things. I work for what I'd call the IT pillar, and underneath the known knowns are things that I know about inside of IT and things that I can help contribute to. Then there's other pillars, such as the engineering group that actually writes most of Red Hat's software. But Red Hat as a company is kind of interesting in that there's lots of different groups that sometimes consume the, the services that IT is putting out there. So like we offer email, we offer the corporate LDAP, people will consume that stuff. But the other groups also kind of set up their own things and go off in their own world. And I really have no idea what most of those other people are doing a lot of the time. And that kind of stuff's listed on the known unknowns under this slide. So first off, uh, we know that there's about 3,000 IT managed VMs, at least 800 cloud instances. We're getting close to 12,000 employees now. We have about 100 SSO integrations. And on the IT side of the house, almost everything is built using configuration management, whether that's Ansible or Puppet. 90% uh, of our server base is RHEL. We have a very complex account lifecycle management process right now. So onboarding, uh, you know, different managers have to approve different steps. There's other systems involved that run specific scripts and create stuff on our backends and also calls out to SaaS vendors and creates things there. Same for termination. Uh, our current LDAP servers have a tremendous load on them all the time. So these are just kind of things that we know about and things we have to be careful with as we start moving to IDM. The unknowns that I know are out there is engineering and labs. Uh, I know that there, some of them are consuming the Kerberos and LDAP stuff that we've set up, but I have no idea how they've configured their systems to do that. Um, additionally, kind of getting the word out to all of the different pillars at Red Hat is a little bit challenging. Um, you know, there's like wide swaths of mailing lists and stuff like that, but it's just hard to f find all the right people that need to know what you're going to do. Uh, there's also different pillars that have some shadow IT stuff. Again, we have no idea what those folks are doing. People are running containers everywhere, and I don't know what that means for them moving to other systems like IDM. And we have people running like mission critical applications under their desks. So. There have been situations in the past where IT's made a big change. Something broke. Nobody could figure out why. They track it down. OK, well, this guy that used to work here left this running here. Nobody knows what it's doing. But OK, well, it's doing something important. So now we have to figure out what broke. Um, there's also vendors using our LDAP servers. So we offer secured TLS endpoints using certificate-based auth so that specific vendors can query a reduced set of attributes from our employees to provision accounts on their systems and things like that. But I'm also relatively certain that there's people inside of Red Hat, business owners and other tech-like teams that are gathering information from our LDAP servers because, I mean, it's easy to do, and then feeding that to vendors in ways that we're not aware of, whether that's dumping LDAP to a CSV and SFTPing it to a vendor or whatever, getting it out of LDAP and calling APIs. I know some of that stuff's happening. I don't know who's doing it. And once we switch to IDM, things will just slowly but surely break for those situations. So this is going to go over kind of what our current configuration is. So we have multiple data centers. We're running a MIT Kerberos master that propagates to the other data centers. We have dog tag, which is um, RHCS that's Red Hat's uh, certificate project, so you can you know, cut TLS certs for servers and clients. We also have 389 or RHDS, which is Red Hat's LDAP server implementation. 
those dog tag and 389 are both multi-master copying from all the data centers. And then we have a DNS master of bind that sends data to slaves everywhere. So currently on the IT side of the house, uh, the servers that are running <laughs> RHEL 6 are doing NSSS, PAM, LDAP-D, PAM Kerberos 5, NSLCD, and NSCD. Um, kind of your, your legacy setup with auth config, if people are familiar with that. And our RHEL 7 boxes are using SSSD. And almost all of those servers are puppet managed. So my group has already started writing the code that will help people migrate from the old systems to SSSD and to free IPA that we're standing up. Uh, there's also IT supported clients. So we have a service desk and a help desk style thing. We have a desktop team that puts together corporate standard builds of laptops that go out to our employees. Uh, so they support RHEL 7, Windows, and Mac OS X. Um, and then there's also all kinds of people bringing pretty much anything you could imagine to Red Hat and running it and however they feel like it. In the perfect world, this is what we would move to. So in a couple slides back, each one of these systems are kind of, you know, they're all related. People use them. They're all identity and access management based. But each one of those requires a cluster in every data center. And each one of those is not tightly coupled. So basically, our PKI system kind of sits off in its own little corner. People access it through APIs. People end up cutting certs and then laying them down on their servers in various ways, whether that's through Ansible or Puppet or just SCP and files over. But that, that dog tag instance doesn't really have any tie-ins to our directory server. And same similar stuff goes for the Kerberos systems. There's automation in place right now that will allow people to get host key tabs and server key tabs and help them copy them to their systems. But all of that's kind of like custom bolted on code that we've written in house. Some of the stuff that IDM offers is ways to streamline that and make it a lot easier using commands built into the IPA CLI. So instead of having to script getting a key tab, I could run, run a command that's something like IPA get key tab or get cert for getting a TLS cert. And it just all magically happens. So in addition to reducing our footprint and having less to manage, you can see that we're reducing those four or five things into just one cluster. So IDM is serving all of those purposes, DNS, Kerberos, LDAP, PKI. So it's really a management win, and this is where we're trying to get to because it's a lot easier to handle, and it has the built-in abilities, as I mentioned before, that kind of make automation easier. Uh, where we're trying to get the, the systems to in the new perfect world config is EL6 and EL7 servers using SSSD and IPA clients. Again, Puppet or Ansible managed. And then those remote clients uh, that Service Desk takes care of, we want to work with them to make sure that they can release RPMs for the RHEL 7 laptops that they support. And then I think they use Big Fix or something for Windows people and Mac people. But basically, make sure that they have all of that stuff in place so once we switch to IDM, they can push out changes and the clients that are out there will start consuming them without you know hundreds of people bombarding service desk one day and saying this stuff doesn't work anymore. Uh, the other thing I'd like to see us do better is writing instructions for common bring your own devices setups. So a lot of people will run Fedora on their laptops and we do have some documentation around that. But you know, I've seen people running Slackware, I've seen people running Ubuntu, so kind of trying to figure out what people use the most and writing instructions so that they can configure their own systems to use the stuff that we're going to offer through IDM. So getting there is going to be a multi-year and multi-phase process. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to keep our existing infrastructure and we're going to add an IDM uh, cluster as well. Then we're going to establish a cross-realm Kerberos trust between the two systems, so between MIT Kerberos and IDM. Then we're going to do a DNS zone delegation to the free IPA, free IPA servers. Then comes the long and arduous task of getting all the systems and all the users to migrate over to start using Kerberos on IDM and stop using Kerberos on the MIT stuff that we have set up today. 
Once we accomplish that, we're going to shut off MIT Kerberos. So then phase three is RHDS cutoff and reduced. So part of this process is taking all of the data that's in LDAP or all the data that we can that's currently in 389 server and moving that to IDM so people can still see their their user information uh, in LDAP and use it for uh, you know user look user lookups or NSS lookups or whatever they're doing with that. Uh, phase four is going to be RHCS cutoff. So again, uh, IPA offers some great features with CertMonger and GetCert so that it's very easy for people to be able to pull certs from IDM. And that's going to be a lot nicer than the RHCS stuff that we have now, which is still great. But again, it's, it's more tightly coupled and easier to use than having something standing off in the corner by itself which is what RHCS is for us right now. Uh, phase five is kind of exploring uh, the OTP functionality of free IPA and then also exploring the DNS offerings of free IPA more. So this talks mainly on phase one. We haven't gotten any further than that, but known limitations of things that we've already hit is the IDM migration is still rough around the edges so cross-realm Kerberos support is not directly supported. It works, but it we have encountered some bugs. Uh, the out-of-the-box migration scripts are also somewhat limited. Um, they're built more to do kind of like a one-and-done approach. Like, I want to take everything out of LDAP, put it into IDM, and then the next day everybody's going to talk to IDM, and we're just going to cut off the old systems. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, it's not really built or we haven't been able to use it in a fashion where we just keep refreshing data on the new systems. Some of our internal applications at Red Hat are currently using data in LDAP for their specific application needs. So we've developed custom OUs and custom schemas so that a team could, for instance, look up a product number and an attribute for a product entry, things of that nature. Um, that meets the application's needs. But IDM is really built and optimized for standard users and groups data. So whenever we get to this point, we have to decide if we want to dirty up what IDM is offering by including a bunch of custom OUs and schemas there and seeing what kind of performance impact that would have, or if it makes sense for us to basically scale down our RHDS infrastructure now so that it just offers that custom work, that custom schema and custom OU stuff for the internal applications. Uh, our current RHCS system uses an HSM for key storage. Uh, IDM doesn't support that yet, but I know that it's on their radar. So if we want to kill off RHCS, we either have to get that into the product or we have to uh, be okay with a slightly less secure setup. Uh, for OTP, I know some of our networking gear uses Radius to talk to our current OTP solution, and I haven't done any research yet to know if they can talk LDAP to free IPA, and if not, then I don't know what we do. We might end up having to keep uh, the current OTP solution. There's also our DNS infrastructure right now is very large, and it's managed in a way that people are used to. So people do get checkouts and get commits and merges and stuff like that, and that rolls out across the system. So if we want to completely get rid of bind, uh, it's going to be not only do we need to check and make sure that you know, it's going to be able to handle all the records and all the stuff we throw at it and all the changes that we make, it's going to be kind of a political battle to get people to change their minds about how they want to update DNS. So some of the phase one challenges we've already hit are password migration. So in RHDS or in 389 directory server, there's a really awesome feature called PAM pass-through. And what that's allowed us to do for several years now is not keep user password hashes on user entries in LDAP. So whenever somebody does a bind to our LDAP servers, the LDAP servers transparently in the background will reach out to Kerberos and authenticate that person. Or we can set it up to do that with any PAM module. We also have LDAP servers set up to talk radius to our OTP solution. So people can, again, bind with their pen and token, and that would auth to an OTP site solution. All of that's really awesome because that limits how much, uh, how much exposure your passwords are. You know, they're stored on one system. They're not stored in multiple places. But the IDM really wants you to have a user password hash whenever you're going to go ahead and do migration. So they support SSSD, 
And when they support SSSD, the user tries, or, or it basically tries against their user password hash. And then if that's there, it will go ahead and update the Kerberos password hash. Same with the web UI migration utility that they offer. It checks the user password hash and then uh, updates the Kerberos uh, principal hash. So again, we don't have user password in our LDAP, so that's kind of a non, those are non-starters for us. The other thing that they offer or that they suggest doing is mass setting users' passwords and that's kind of a management nightmare. So, you know, you have to set somebody's password and then, okay, how do I contact that person? I don't really want to email passwords. So then we have to do PGP keys and, you know, you try to explain to a finance person how to read an email that's PGP encrypted and you don't get very far. So um, that's not really a good solution either. So we've come up with a different solution. Uh, IPA offers a special uh, config variable and a special entry where you can list out UIDs that are allowed to set other people's passwords. And not only are they allowed to set other people's passwords, they're allowed to bypass password setting restrictions, meaning that this password service account can update a person's password and then the next time that person logs in, they're not required to change it immediately. So we've set up account, we've set up a service account like that, and then we've written a basic web app that's going to bind to IDM using that credential. And people will authenticate to this web app using legacy credentials and SAML. And then that web app will use that IPA service account to make a call out to the IPA API and set that person's password. Um, so that's, that's pretty neat, it's pretty slick, it works. Uh, so people will log in using their legacy credentials, they'll choose their new password, it'll be set immediately in IPA underneath uh, the user password record in LDAP and in the Kerberos hash. Other big thing we're hitting is data synchronizations. This is what I hit, or what I hit on a little bit earlier. So IPA Migrate DS is great for kind of a one and done approach. Uh, we used it for our initial data import, but Red Hat, again, is a very widely dispersed company, so, and there's a lot of employees. We can't just do a one import and then, you know, we do that on Friday. Everybody comes in on Monday and all their stuff's working. I don't know how to tell people to configure their stuff because I don't know what they're running. And on top of that, again, you'd, would, you would run into people that don't understand, and we would have to staff, like, a huge help desk for weeks that but just receive phone calls and things to help people through that process. But with that said, if you're a smaller company or if you can do anything to prevent what I'm about to show you the solution is, I strongly advise it because what we're doing here is really nasty. So we have a data synchronization script and it's running out of cron and it compares entries on a per attribute level taking into account differences in OU structures. So the OU is different in the IPA world than it is in our current RHDS system or than our current MIT Kerberos realms or yeah, inside of the LDAP structure as well. And if the attributes don't match with what we've defined as the source of authority for that attribute, then the downstream system get up, gets updated. So what this means is there's business logic in RHDS or legacy systems that say this new data, anytime this new data is up added here or changed here, I want you to replace that information in IPA with that. But then there's also the reverse business logic. Whenever something new gets created in IPA, I want you, or updated in IPA, I want you to go back and update that stuff in the legacy RHDS systems. So this business logic will change over time and it's going to be a disaster because it's gonna end up with people changing something and not realizing that that's going to impact other people using the legacy systems or the new systems. And yeah, we're going to do the best with what we can with this and then hopefully get people to migrate quickly so we don't have to keep this kind of hacky solution in very long. Uh, other thing we hit was poor bidirectional trust support in apps. So some applications are basically expecting you to use the at old.realm, so it's looking for, in our case, at redhat.com, and that's our old MIT Kerberos realm. 
And it does that, I'm not sure why, but some applications are actually doing that hard in code. So one of our own applications, RHSSO, is looking for at redhat.com because you've configured that as its key tab and all that stuff. So it knows what the realm is, but it should never be checking for that exact realm because people could have trust. Uh, other applications, we've hit one with Zimbra. You have to make changes on a per user basis to support principles from different realms. And then we've hit some of the same things where uh, you know bidirectional trust and those two realms don't necessarily play nice with settings that are out of the box with SSH or mod auth curb. But those were pretty well documented on how to fix those and you can just change those settings globally in those applications and go about with your day. So what we've done to fix that is we filed RFEs for the code issues. As people are migrating, we're gonna work with them to change per user configs. And we're putting together documentation on what needs to change in krb5.comps or in mod auth curb setups. So we've kind of fixed or addressed this on the IT side of the house. But again, with uh, there's different pillars at Red Hat. I have no idea what those people are doing. So the best we can offer is here's documentation on what you might want to do and kind of distribute that out and let them handle it as they can or you know, after the drop dead date and all their stuff breaks, whichever one they feel like doing. Uh, we hit a couple other issues along the way. These are minor and more annoying than they are real issues like the other two. So we, one thing we were really looking forward to is auto membering. And what this allows you to do is add members to a group in LDAP uh, based on an attribute that they have. So Red Hat reorgs pretty regularly. And with that, uh, we have issues where, you know, if I used to work on dev team A and then I get moved to dev team B, I'm still in all the dev, a, or dev, dev team A's LDAP groups and I still have all the permissions that I had whenever I worked in dev team A. So that's something that we would like to solve. Um, and auto membrane is touted as being able to do that, but unfortunately it does not currently remove users from groups when you change the attribute. I think it does the auto membrane when things are created, but not necessarily on changes. And they're working on that, so that'll hopefully be fixed in the near future. Another thing we fit is uh, limited limited look-through limits, and uh, that's basically um, if somebody does an LDAP search and they want to go ahead and pull down all the records from LDAP, eventually there's, there's a set limit that says, okay, you can only get like 10,000 records, and then we're not going to give you any more. So we've tried to change that to infinite because that's what people are used to, and I know that people are running scripts that download everything in the LDAP directory and then process it locally and then do stuff with that. I'm not super fond of those people doing that, but at the same time, like, it's a give and take because otherwise I've seen people come to me and ask, or people have come to me and ask, do you mind if I download the entire LDAP directory? Like, yes, please don't do that. But then they say, okay, well, I need to get a recursion tree of all these people. So, okay, tell me how you're gonna do that. Well, I'm gonna look up this user, then I'm gonna look up this user's group, then I'm gonna, like, and it goes on and on, and then I watch the guy do it, and the logs, okay, well, you just hit the LDAP server 800 times in a minute, so I don't know. You know, maybe it is better for you to suck down all the information. Um, the other thing that we've hit is the product supports full server backups, which is fantastic. Um, but to run those backups, you have to take a node offline. Not a big deal. Uh, we were just going to build an additional node that nobody would access and then take that node offline to do the backups, bring it back online. We could also tinker around with things on it, use it kind of like as an admin box for our team. Uh, unfortunately though, whenever you stand up a node uh, or join it as a replica in free IPA currently, it's assigned a serve record and a priority, and that priority matches all the other systems. And basically what that means is as people start using IPA, the backup server will be advertised to them and they will try to connect to it. Uh, so we've submitted some bugs and RFEs around that because otherwise, while that server is doing a backup, people's clients will 
at least suffer a little bit of lag as they have to try another system. Or if it's a poorly written application, it would just be broken until you know, the net, that specific node comes back online. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> so, like I said, we've uh, filed bugs and RFEs uh, for those things. And that's basically all I have. Does anybody have any questions or anything? Yeah? Uh, IBM uh, has this uh, flat uh, build-up structure, basically, like you mentioned in the beginning. And it's quite common to use different organizational units uh, for delegating the access or management permissions or something like that. So, and you mentioned you have those in place as well. So how, how are you planning to migrate those like different uh, organization unit uh, structures to uh, free IPA? Sure. Uh, so the question was, um, free IPA has kind of a flat OU structure. How am I planning to move specific OUs with specific like ACI style stuff to IDM? Uh, the answer to that is to be determined at this point. Um, so yes, we do have in our legacy RHDS system, we have several OUs that are specific to apps and we have specific ACI set on that. So we'll basically, if a group comes to us and say, hey, we've written this awesome app and we want these people to be able to access it and we wanna authorize them based on group membership and LDAP, okay, cool. So we create the group and then we give them a service account so that they can update that group membership so that they can control who's able to access their app in different fashions. I'm not sure how we're going to approach that in IDM yet. Any other questions? What? How do you deal with Windows clients? <laughs> Windows clients on your network. Yeah, so the question was, how do I deal with Windows clients? Um, so the answer is, my team does not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's somebody else's problem. Uh, but that's only going to be somebody else's problem for a bit. So uh, it's on our radar as we start to take over DNS more and more with free IPA. Uh, they run AD DNS, and other people run other DNS devices. There's been talks about us taking over the, at least some of the DNS aspects and then probably most likely the Active Directory components as well, but we're gonna to have to explore some before some and figure out exactly what we're gonna do with that. Um, but yes, we do have a Windows base. Uh, current legacy RHDS has uh, replication agreements. So RHDS supports basically AD replication. So we have it set up so if you get an account in LDAP, it will replicate that to Active Directory. Um, Correct, yeah, not vice versa. You can, I, I believe you can set up both, um, but we haven't because I don't trust what's in AD or the people running it, to be honest. So um, <laughs> then there's... Um, so essentially it's a separate world. Yes, exactly. Now, if you have Windows stuff, and I haven't looked into this much at all because it's not a problem we really have here at Red Hat because there's very few Windows systems, but... Uh, free IPA has amazing options to integrate with Active Directory and Windows things. Um, I think that's kind of some of their bread and butter that they push a lot of, is being able to take this Linux system and now let's make it use AD easily. Yeah? You had this picture with the, with the different faces, project mm -hmm. faces. Um, what about the time frame? Um, yeah, that's a good question. All right, so the question was, you, I have a picture of the migration plan with all the different phases. Uh, what about a time frame? So phase two, I hope, will be done within the next year. Uh, phase three and phase four could probably be completed in the next year. So I'm guessing 2020 <laughs> to be done with everything. Um, I don't like that timeline, but I just know that it's gonna take a while. Um, alternatively, we can uh, push people to move faster, but we also need uh, lots of different manager buy-in and stuff like that. So again, I can get that relatively easy on the IT side of the house and move those systems, but in all the other situations where I have no idea what people are doing, uh, we need to be more cautious. Any other questions?
Thank you. No? Thanks, everybody.